Good morning on this 4th of July. I know it's a holiday, but here we are to talk about Stoicism. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a downer. Um, how many of you would like to take more control of your happiness? How many of you would like to reduce the amount of suffering, grief, frustration, anxiety, and other kinds of so-called negative emotions uh, in your life? Have a bit more serene life, a bit more peaceful? Okay, yeah, me too. Um, and you're not alone. Um, and one of the things that that people are looking for, uh, it, I mean, when people are looking for that kind of thing, they often look to um, books or podcasts in the self-help, self-improvement sphere. And one of the things that people are turning to a lot today is the ancient Greek philosophy of Stoicism. So if you're not, I mean, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the philosophy of Stoicism, others aren't. Uh, it's an ancient Greek philosophy that flourished in the centuries following the death of Aristotle. So we're talking roughly 300 BC to 380. It had quite a long life uh, and was influential at various periods throughout history. It's a philosophy that many people, uh, including some of the founding fathers, right? It, it, many people have turned to uh, in times of trouble uh, uh, for solace, consolation, resilience amid adversity, and so on. So it's, it's, it's had, it, it might be an ancient Greek philosophy, but it's had long legs. And the people that people are, the, the people that people, the individual Stoic thinkers that people are often reading today, turning to, drawing on, are typically the later Roman Stoics. So these are people like Seneca, who was advi an advisor to the emperor of Nero, as well as a philosopher and a playwright. Uh, or Epictetus, if you've heard of him. Uh, so he was a former slave. He became a teacher. Uh, he set up his own school uh, in a, a town in Greece. Uh, he was a very famous teacher of Stoicism. And then, obviously, there's, I shouldn't say obviously, uh, there's the em Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, who um, adopted Stoicism as his sort of personal philosophy. And one of the works that we have uh, surviving is his, well, we call it now Meditations, but it's his private journals that we kept, and for some reason we actually have it, uh, and it's it's remained intact. And it's how many have read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations? Out of curiosity, because it's 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 one of the books that many people simply read. Okay, good uh, for enjoyment uh, and for other reasons other than kind of edification or something. Um, and Stoicism today, and not just today, but over the past say decade and a half, is having kind of a cultural moment. So if you go to uh, go on Amazon, for example, and search for Stoicism. You'll find all kinds of books. Uh, to, the idea is to improve your life, find inner serenity, uh, build emotional resilience, even find joy. There's even one on how to get rich. I don't know. <laughs> but that's Ryan Holiday. That's what he does. Um, but uh, lots. Of, it's, it's a big trend today. But I think it's important to look critically at the philosophy of Stoicism. And I've written a number of things that have been critical of Stoicism. Uh, but I think it's important to look critically at it, um, especially if you're looking at it for life guidance. And I'll say something about, and I'd actually like to hear from you. Well, I'm going to leave plenty of time for the questions. I'd like to hear from you if you've read some uh, Stoicism or you followed some podcasts that are drawing on heavily on Stoicism. If you're finding things that you think are valuable for you or helpful or interesting, uh, I'd like to hear what they are and what, the, what they do for you because I, I have a view about how, um, what's, what I think is valuable and what I think is not about the philosophy and ways in which one can find some kind of value. You know, I'll, I'll, I don't want to spoil it, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later and partly I'd like to have a dialogue with you about that uh, if you actually have read this kind of stuff. Because I, I think there are serious problems with the philosophy, but uh, let me begin. I want to begin by setting the context. So what is, this, what is the situation we're in? What is the problem that we face for which Stoicism or Stoic philosophy might be some kind of an answer? It might be some kind of a remedy. And here, the Stoics took the view that there's very little that we control in life. Most of what happens to us in our lives is out of our control. So you get up in the morning, the weather's crummy. You get a snippy email from your boss or your supervisor or whatever. Uh, some guy's playing loud music out in the parking lot while you're trying to work. 
You try to get some peace and quiet, so you go down to the pool and there's a bunch of screaming kids. You show up at your favorite restaurant for a little bit of an oasis away from everything else, and they're closed for a private event. Your insurance company didn't receive your payment check, and you find out you get a letter in the mail that your coverage is canceled. That happened to me. <laughs> um, and, or you get a phone call, and you find that a loved one has died suddenly. So much of what we have, so much of what actually happens to us, is not a direct result of our choices of what directly we can control. It's just there are all sorts of other factors: natural causes, chances, accidents, other people, and so on. So the idea is there's almost nothing that is actually in our control. And what's the result? The result is we suffer. We suffer frustration when we find obstacles in the way to our goals. We suffer grief if we've lost something that's really important to us. Fear when we think we're about to lose something uh, or, or be harmed in some way. Um, anxiety when we when we anticipate or worry that we might something might happen something bad might happen to us. Now you might think, look, this is just life, right? This is just the inescapable human condition. What do you want? We just have to live with it. But the Stoics said no. It is true, in their view, that almost nothing is up to us. <laughs> Most things are out of our control. Um, but we don't have to suffer. We can find a way to control, mitigate, reduce, or eliminate the suffering that we experience in life. Every one of you, they say, has the power to be content, at peace, serene, no matter what happens, no matter what life throws at you. So that's what I call the promise. The promise of Stoicism is that you can take control of your happiness, you can reduce the amount of suffering you have, even the, no matter what life throws at you. Does that sound attractive? Okay. So how is this possible? Well, the Stoics understood something important about the relationship between emotions, how we feel about things, and our judgments, how we evaluate things. For example, suppose you, you accidentally break a vase, you know, a nice vase inside your house. Now, if, it were, if you cherished that vase, suppose you got it in Venice on your 25th wedding anniversary or something, and just, it had a real significance to you, um, you'll be upset understandably. If you hated that vase, it was kind of an eyesore that your mother-in-law gave you and you just put it on the mantle in case she shows up and so you, you might be relieved. If a Doberman is rushing at, uh, rushing at you, you might, if you think you're in danger, you might, you'll experience fear. If you judge that it's just your favorite pet daisy rushing to greet you after you've been gone for a while, you might experience something like joy or delight. So the idea is how you feel about events, how you feel about what happens, how you feel about what, what you encounter, depends on the value significance you place on them. And that should be a point familiar to objectivists, right? That emotions are the product of your value judgments, that emotions have cognitive roots. They, they just, they're not just bolts from the blue. And it was here that the Stoics thought that they found the key to human suffering and the key to alleviating it. They held that we suffer in life because we value, and as a result, desire, all kinds of things that we can fail to get, fail to hang on to. Things that can be lost, stolen, damaged, destroyed. We desire and we value things that we don't fully control. We want things to turn out in a certain kind of way, but we don't control how they actually turn out. We can try, but we don't control the outcomes. And by doing so, we make our happiness, our peace of mind, our serenity, our emotional state, um, what's the word, uh, unsecure, unstable, precarious, impossible to maintain. So what should we do? How should we make our lives better? How should we make our peace of mind more secure, more under our control? And their answer is we have to change our approach to values. 
We have to change what we value. We have to change how we value. We have to value differently. So what's their prescription? Epictetus uh, called his philosophical school a hospital. People with sick souls come to me, and philosophers prescribe, in effect, medication, philosophical medication, and the medication hurts, but it's supposed to do you some good. That, that's the idea. It's therapy for the soul. <clears throat> and here, the key to avoiding suffering and to leading a happy and serene life, they argued, is to value only what's completely up to us. If we do this, we'll be able to always get what we want. We'll never be frustrated, angry, grieving, at odds with the world. And our happiness and serenity won't depend on anything outside our control, anything that we don't have you know, control over. It'll be wholly within our power, wholly up to us. By contrast, if, like, you know, all of you, you're invested in any particular thing or any particular outcome, say a job, a person, a vase, a new car, whatever it is, if you're invested in any particular thing or any particular outcome that you don't fully control, you just set yourself up for suffering. You're just giving hostages to fortune is the idea. So the crucial knowledge we need then is knowledge of what is and what is not up to us. The idea is value only what you can fully control. The idea is, well, what can I fully control and what's out of my control? And here the Stoics took the position that what's fully up to us, what's fully within our power, are our judgments. Our judgments about things. We can't control what happens to us, but we do control whether we judge something as good or bad as a setback, as a loss, as a gain, as an opportunity, however we evaluate things, um, that is up to us, and we control that. As Epictetus put it, it's not things that upset us, but our judgments about things. So the idea is if you can regulate your judgments about the value of various kinds of things or outcomes, this is good, this is bad, this is a setback, this is a loss, this is a tragedy, you have control over how you evaluate them. And once you have that kind of control, you, have a value, you then have control over how you feel about it, what your emotional state is, what your perspective is on it. And if you value, evaluate certain things in a certain kind of way, you can direct yourself toward a kind of serenity. So that's the, that's the idea. Because if you judge something to be good, what happens? You'll want it. You'll care about it. You'll be invested in it. And you'll be upset if you don't get it or you lose it, for example. If you judge something to be bad, you're going to want to avoid it. And you're going to be upset if you can't avoid it, if it, gets, if it hits you anyway. If you judge something to be neither good nor bad, you won't really be invested in it, uh, in attaining it or avoiding it. So if you get it, all right. And if you don't, that's okay. So the key to a serene mental state lies in our value estimates of things. Change the value judgments, and you change your reactions to them. Since you're in control of your value judgments, you're in control of your reactions to what happens, and thereby whether you're happy, sad, frustrated, peaceful. In short, by regulating our value judgments, we can take control of our state of mind. So what we need to do, then, is to recalibrate our view of what is good, and what is bad, what is truly valuable, and what is not. And here's where they get a little more radical. The Stoics took the position, the radical position, that only virtue, or moral character, if you want to put it that way, only virtue is the true good. So only virtue is good, or put it this way, Virtue is the only good. Vice, you know, some kind of moral evil, is the only thing that's bad. Everything else, money, beauty, health, wealth, success, achieving your values out there, actually out there in the world, is what they called indifferent. Which means for them, it means it's neither good nor bad. And irrelevant to a good life. 
irrelevant to a good life. Health, wealth, beauty, actual real world achievement, these are irrelevant to a good life. They're neither because they're neither good nor bad. Now it's worth well, I'll pause for that. Now that sounds probably pretty extreme. Like whether you have a shirt on your back, and they mean this. The modern Stoics today mitigate this quite a lot. But because uh, that's a hard pill to swallow. The idea that, I mean, if you asked Epictetus, whether you are enslaved or or not enslaved, I say free, but that's a technical thing for Epictetus. So Epictetus' view is that's irrelevant to happiness. Because you can achieve a virtuous character, and that's all you need for a good life. Because you're in control of your character, you're in control of your judgments, you're in control of your evaluation of your situation. And as long as you know that virtue is the only good, the perspective you have on your condition, say as a slave, um, whether you have any money or you have much clothes on your back, uh, these things they want to regard as irrelevant to a good life. Now, I think it's important to recognize that the idea here was to make the good life uh, a good life for a human being, dependent only on what we can control, and to make our well-being independent of, and in fact impervious to, external circumstances. This is where you look at this get hard, get invincible kind of element of stoicism, is nothing can hurt me. Judge that I'm not hurt, and I won't be hurt. That's the idea. So take control of the judgments, and you won't be hurt. You're invincible. Now, I think it's wor it is worth mentioning also that the period during which these ideas were developed was a tumultuous period, particularly the Roman period that the Roman Stoics are writing in. Uh, so there was a lot of hardship, there was a lot of uncertainty, uh, there was a lot of murder, <laughs> there was a lot of death. Uh, I mean, Marcus Aurelius survived most of his children, uh, so many of his children died. Uh, so it was a common thing in the Roman world, even for an emperor. Um, so life was uh, more precarious. But they developed all sorts of techniques to help you sort of practice or maintain the idea that external things, uh, the things that most of us are invested in and we take as important in our lives, um, are actually unimportant. And I'll mention just a few. One, which we see a lot in Marcus Aurelius' meditations. And these are interesting works, by the way. These are not, I'm critical, so don't read it. It's, it's really interesting. Um, one of the things you'll see a lot in Marcus Aurelius is taking the, what, he, what I call the cosmic perspective from the perspective of the universe. So you think you've suffered some kind of tragedy or loss or setback. But if you view your situation from the perspective of the entire cosmos, uh, you can see your problems as insignificant. I remember when I was preparing this talk, I remember I seen, seeing some meme on Facebook or whatever, and it's got a picture of the, the whole galaxy, and there's the little arrow pointing to this tiny little portion of the galaxy where Earth is, and it says, you crying in the shower. And it's that kind of thing. And you know, there might be a good reason why you're crying in the shower and it's really important to your life and something really happened. But that's the idea is to kind of like, look, it doesn't mean a hill of beans, you know, when you kind of look at the thing from the whole. And it's a way of sort of, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you smashed up your car. And yes, your wife has cancer or something like, but you step back. These things happen, right? You're not the only human being in the world. You're not the only one who has... Uh, I mean, we're all immortal, right? So it's just sort of, this is part of nature. This is part of the whole flow of life. And it's a way of telling yourself these kinds of things so you can be sort of at peace with things that happens and be undisturbed, un unharmed. Another technique, <clears throat> uh, or the other thing is to remind yourself of how ephemeral things are. Uh, we don't live very long. You know, you talk about a bottle fly or something like that. They live like a day or something like that. It's, but it's like we're creatures of a day. Um, whether it's fame, our goals, our bodies, our place in history, our reputations, and so on. As Marcus put it, quote, altogether human affairs must be regarded as ephemeral and of little worth. Yesterday sperm, tomorrow a mummy or ashes. And again, these are techniques for kind of making things seem like it, this is not significant. Another technique which I call stripping is when you start to think that some is... So here's the, here's the problem. The problem is... You start to think that some external thing is good, valuable, interesting, like worth having, you want it. Uh, 
And then the technique is to sort of downgrade it by describing it in terms that strip away the value significance that we often place on these things. So again, from Marcus Aurelius, quote, How useful when roasted meats and other foods are before you to see them in your mind as here the body of a dead fish, there the body of a, a dead bird or pig. Or again, to think of Falernian wine, it must be a very kind of fine wine or something, as the juice of a cluster of grapes, of a purple robe, which were highly valued for their beauty, as sheep wool dyed with the blood of a shellfish, and of sexual intercourse as internal rubbing accompanied by the spasmodic ejection of mucus. It's quite the romantic. Um, what useful perceptual images these are. They go to the heart of things, and they pierce right through them so that you can see things for what they are. So it's describing them purely in physical terms, in sort of reductionist terms, so the idea is to strip away the value significance we normally place on them. The idea is, that's all they are. And if you come to realize that, it's, okay, so yeah, I'm, it's, it's not that interesting, not that attractive, I can detach myself from them. Now, an aspect of this technique is to remind yourself that things we care about are easily lost, easily destroyed. We're all mortal, right? So you won't get hurt when it happens. It won't come as a shock to you. And here's, a, here's one from Epictetus. Epictetus is quite stark. Quote, When faced with anything you find attractive, useful, or lovable, remember to tell yourself what kind of a thing it is. Start with the least important things. If it's a jug you like or a piece of china, tell yourself, I like a jug, because then you won't be upset if it gets broken. If you kiss a child of yours or your wife, tell yourself that you're kissing a human being, because then you won't be upset if they die. Now, that's one of these passages that modern Stoics um, finesse quite a lot. Um, which I think is wrong. It's better, but wrong. So one of the things that, uh, if, you, if you look at different kinds of modern Stoics today, when they come across a passage like that, which sounds like Jesus, <laughs> you know, just tell yourself your wife is mortal, and you won't be upset. And now that sounds harsh, and some of them will rush to say, no, 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 they don't, they don't mean that. No, that would be cold and feeling harsh. They're just saying, realize they're mortal and spend a lot of time with them and just, you know, it's reap all the enjoyment you can out of life. And that's not what the ancient Stoics thought. That sounds better, <laughs> but, but it's not the Stoic perspective. Now, you might wonder, if they take this attitude toward values, to, toward external things uh, and actual real-world achievements of that. And their view is, that's not really important. That's not really, you shouldn't be invested in any of that. You shouldn't be invested in any particular thing. You shouldn't be invested in any kind of outcome. It's hard to care about things. But if you take that attitude, what's the point of virtue? Like, why would you develop virtue? Why would the Stoics be so committed to the importance of virtue? And they, they took that seriously. It was really important to them. Um, and here, I think part of the answer is that uh, they, this has to go back to their metaphysics. Their view is that the universe is designed by a benevolent God that infuses, literally infuses everything in the, in the cosmos. Our reason, our mind, is just a fragment or an offshoot of God's mind. So they have a kind of pantheistic view, if you're familiar with that term, like God is infused in everything. Uh, and that God is benevolent, and he's designed everything for a specific purpose. So the, the good here is the, the good of the cosmos as a whole. And God has designed us in such a way that reason is our distinctive characteristic. So if we have reason, and that's our distinctive characteristic, it's because God wants us to have it. It's just God has designed us to develop it. So the idea is, it's, is it, it's as if it's sanctioned by nature, slash God, slash fate. They called it different names. And so the reason to, to be virtuous is to live up to and develop our, in effect, God-given capacities, not to achieve the values that we want in the world. Because, and this goes back to the other element, is they're determinists. So the idea is that 
Everything that happens down to its last detail is fated to happen exactly as it does happen. Nothing can happen otherwise than it does. Uh, and so this is part of the metaphysical perspective that they have that I think pushes them toward this view. I mean, look, if you really thought, like think of you were in prison and you knew that there was no chance of escape. You couldn't bribe the guard, pick the lock, do some kind of MacGyver thing. Um, none of that's possible. And you, you j what you literally had to do was simply accommodate yourself to your situation. It might make sense then to say, well, I just have to take a certain kind of attitude. I have to find a way to just... Okay, you know, be calm and comfortable with it to the extent that you can, because you, there's no other, you can't do anything else about it. Um, you might also wonder, why do they bother about, so it's not like the Stoics just sort of laid down on the couch and let the universe pass by, right? I mean, they lived lives and they did things. I mean, Seneca, as I said, was an advisor to Nero. Um, Marcus Aurelius is trying to stop the hordes <laughs> coming in from the north. Uh, so he's involved in wars, the Macromonic Wars and stuff. Um, why, what are they doing busying themselves with externals, you know, the things outside of our control? Um, and they give two answers to this. One is externals, as I call it, externals, these are things outside of our control. Uh, externals give us an opportunity to exercise virtue, to sort of build our moral muscle. Um, and we have an obligation, a duty, you know, to the cosmos in effect to develop our, our virtue. And this gives us an opportunity. Um, and the second is that the good life consists in a, uh, living in agreement with nature, as they put it. Um, and this, in a case, means living in agreement with the way God set things up and developing our faculties and stuff. So they had reasons to develop virtue, aside from whether it actually helps us attain any kind of thing outside us. So in summary, it's suffering comes from attachments to things that you don't control. Get rid of those attachments, and you get rid of suffering. It doesn't mean literally you don't care at all about externals but it's just that you shouldn't be attached to them. You shouldn't think that they matter that much. You shouldn't think they, they matter to your happiness. The whole essence of it is happiness is about, well, happiness is a little strong. That's a translation of eudaimonia. It's, it's best living well is probably the better way to think about it. But living well consists in um, a smooth life with a kind of serenity and virtue and stuff. But the whole idea is that it, it, it's all about what you can control. And if you invest in other things that you can't control, you're just setting yourself up for suffering. So on the one hand, Stoicism holds out the, prom the, the promise that if you, if you follow its guidance, no matter what circumstances you're in, no matter what life throws at you, you can live a happy and serene life. And its guidance is to sever your attachment to worldly values so you won't suffer. But this comes at a cost. By counseling us to detach from our values and pursue virtue as an end in itself, Stoicism encourages people to kill off or dampen what makes life worth living and virtue worth having. If you think about all those things you love in life, your romantic partner, your career, art, travel, music, cuisine, hiking, your new car, and new puppy. Now change your mindset so that you don't care that much about these things. Learn to regard them as irrelevant to your happiness. You can pursue some of them, but remind yourself that it doesn't matter much whether you get them or lose them. Don't get attached to them. Then you won't get hurt. Then you'll be unshackled by worldly uh, attachments, and you'll, you can be serene whether you lose a leg, a fortune, or a child. But this kind of tranquility, if you fully achieve it, I think is spiritual death. Imagine telling Dagny Taggart, don't be attached to your railroad or to the music of Richard Halley or to Hank Reardon or John Galt. Train yourself to see them like a cup or a jug so that if they're destroyed, you won't be upset. Imagine telling Kira Argunova from We the Living that whether she escapes Soviet Russia or is forced to stay, whether she's expelled from engineering school has to live in poverty or is shot at the border, is indifferent to her happiness and her well-being. That all that really matters is the inner condition of her character, of her soul, and that she should accept whatever happens with equanimity. If, the, if those characters, now of course these are dramatized characters in fiction, but if, the, if they were to internalize that perspective, it would kill their love of life, 
and destroy who they are. Can you imagine Akira detached from worldly values? And one of the things that makes these heroes in Rand's novels so admirable is, I think, their love of existence, their passionate commitment to seeing their values realized in the world, and their conviction that their life is precious and irreplaceable, not an indifferent. I want to say something about why I take such a negative view of this kind of detachment that the Stoics advocate. And we can talk about what extent uh, they advocate the detachment if you want. Because valuing necessarily involves attachment. It necessarily involves attachment. To value something just is to acknowledge its importance to you. And that it makes a difference to you whether you get it or not. It means desiring it and acting to gain and to keep it. Not with dispassionate detachment, but with interest and investment. You can't value something without being attached in some way. So I think if the idea is to detach yourself from these things, it means to not value them. It means a life where you do not value these things. Now, technically, they have a term, axia, which means value, and things, external things can have value. And so some of them are preferred, and some of them are dispreferred. I think that's just a way of sneaking values in, because you can't be indifferent to things like health, wealth, food, et cetera. And I don't mean wealth like Bill Gates. I mean, just like, you know, that means uh, property. You can't, be in, you can't be completely indifferent to those and still live. So, so they call it some of them preferred, because God has set us up such that we naturally prefer self-preservation to self-destruction. We naturally prefer pleasure to pain. And God set us up that way, so we ought to live in accordance with how God told us to do. Not because we love those things, but because it's a duty, to, uh, a duty of compliance to God's will. And the second thing I'll say is that why are they so scared of pain and loss? Why is the idea, let's eliminate all these so-called negative emotions? I don't like that term. They're negative in the sense that it doesn't feel good, you know, to have them, to experience them. Um, but they're a necessary concomitant of valuing. If your wife dies and you, don't, you get yourself to the point where you don't experience grief, did you care anyway? Didn't, didn't you get yourself to a situation where it doesn't matter that much to you? You just got a puppy and it gets hit in the road and run over or something and you're like, yeah, I knew it was mortal. Then you just don't really care that much about it, right? So the idea, if you, if you, get, you to this point, if you get yourself to the point where you can strip away and, make, and not have to feel negative emotions, I don't think the result is that you feel positive emotions, like wiping off the mud from your boots and the, underneath it's a nice shiny boot. I don't think that's what you get. I think what you get is the elimination of positive emotions. I mean, emotions are not things to, to get rid of or to dampen. You can experience emotions in an irrational way, for sure, and they can take control of you and you live in anger all your life. And yeah, of course, there are ways to do that. But emotions are the form in which you experience your connection to your values. Extirpating the ones that hurt weakens our connections to our values. To get yourself to the point where you no longer grieve the loss of a child or feel disappointment in failing to attain something important you wanted in life, is to get yourself to not care about these things. What's left is not positive feeling, but the placid calm of spiritual death. So in the end, I just want to close by saying, and then I'll open up for questions, is that although Stoicism promises resilience and inner peace, and they provide, their method is to detach from the values that make life worth living, and for that reason, I think it's actually, their approach to valuing is actually antithetical to happiness and to everything that makes life enjoyable. So, thank you. That's an excellent talk, Aaron. So, can you tell us a little bit about like the philosophical and historical connection between Stoicism and things like Buddhism? where I know there's also this excitement about being detached. And when I looked it up just quick, quick it actually used the word, uh, like, no thought. Like they, I think they go even deeper in that saying. 
Now, about the historical connection between Stoicism and Buddhism, that's a historical issue, and I don't know much about that. There's all sorts of speculation about to what extent there was some sort of cross-pollination or in the sense that the Roman Empire extended all the way, and even in the Greek period, Alexander's uh, um, empire extended all the way pretty far east, and there could have been contact. We don't really know. But it's, it's, I think it's not uncommon for, this is around, you know, looking back to the connections made around 600 BC and stuff, that the idea is that, um, does, I, mean, I mean, this is famous from, from Buddhism. You know, it, uh, it's the idea is, we, why do we suffer? Because we desire things. If you can stop desiring things, you can stop suffering, is the idea. And there's an element of that, a heavy element of that in Stoicism. But the Stoics um, would, wouldn't be trying to eliminate the self. Let's get rid of the self, not the whole non-self notion. No, they, they wouldn't. The idea is, no, yourself is your reason. Uh, and the virtues are, are ways in which you can perfect reason. They're forms of wisdom about the world. Um, and so, yeah, they would. But there is a sense in which I think that you, I don't think they mean to do this exactly, but uh, that you do extinguish a self to some extent. I mean, because, I mean, what it, part, a heavy element of what yourself is are your personal values, the things that you care about. When you find somebody, I like that person. Like, it's their personality, something about their person is interesting. It's they're passionate about something. They care about something. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's race cars, whatever. It's just, there's someone there who cares, who's invested. And, and I think to the extent that you can sort of step back from those, and yeah, I like those things, but I, I just need to have a detachment. I think you lose a certain element of personality. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk, Aaron. Um, one question I had is on the cosmic perspective and how that interfaces with this benevolent God that pervades everything. You know, it seems like the cosmic perspective essentially frames all of the events and outcomes in your life, good or bad, to be insignificant based on a comparative of scale or complexity or something like that. But how is this consistent with like a benevolent God that's predetermined that your whole life is insignificant? It's insignificant in relation to the whole. So the idea is, and this is one of the things interesting about Marcus Aurelius. So his view is that it's a benevolent God who has structured everything for the best. For, for the best for, to the extent that he can for individuals, but more importantly for the whole. So by taking the cosmic perspective, you can step back and say, yes, this seems like a setback to me. It seems like a loss to me. But in the context of the whole, it's one part of what leads to the wider good of the whole. So you can see it as, well, good from a certain perspective, though from my limited perspective, it seems like a loss. And sometimes he'll tell himself, for example, uh, you lose a child. Don't tell yourself that you lost a child. You're giving it back. In effect, that the universe, you know, has given you something for a certain time and then for the, you know, it, it, Christians do this stuff too. It's kind of like a God wants your child back and... It's that sort of thing. You put like a happy benevolent spin on it to kind of make, to, to eliminate some of the hurt. So benevolent zero sum. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it seems to me that both Stoicism and Hedonism are an application of the same basic premise, namely determinism, but they come to opposite conclusions. Can you compare the um, philosophical roots of the two schools? Well, I don't see the connection between hedonism and determinism. Hedonism is the view that pleasure is the good, uh, and that you know a good life is a life of pleasure. And, and if you look back to like the the ancient Greek hedonists, like the Epicureans, who were the kind of opponent school of the Stoicism uh, uh, of the Stoics, I mean, their view was that pleasure is the good. But their view of pleasure and the highest form of pleasure uh, was basically non discontent, non displeasure. Like they said, the, ple uh, the best form of pleasure is like a good digestion. You don't notice it. It's not like the active pleasure of like you sit in a hot tub and you're like, oh, you know, or sex or something like that, you know. That's too disturbing. Uh, so both of them are ways in which you're trying to get to some kind of serene state. But um, yeah, I don't see the connection between hedonism and determinism. Uh, I'm not sure if those have a similar root, but what the, what's the, one of the similarities between them? I think this is true of all the ancient, so the post-Aristotelian schools, so the Epicureans, uh, the, the skeptics, uh, and the Stoics, they're all in retreat, I think, from life. The Stoics want to retreat into the inner citadel of the mind, fortify themselves against hurt. 
the Epicureans want to retreat to their garden, don't play any role in politics, you know, have some mild conversation with some friends and sober pleasures. And the, the ancient Greek skeptics were, well, the reason why we suffer is because we hold uh, judgments about what's true and what's good, you know, and so let's stop holding those. Um, thank you. I uh, never read any uh, anything about Stoicism, but um, from your lecture I realized that uh, many of the uh, uh, things I learned in my youth and from the authority figures um, sort of link in with these ideas, and I uh, wanted to ask, can you elaborate on how it's um, permeating in the culture, this uh, Stoicism? Um, I don't know a lot about the whole historical connection, but that the... Um, Epictetus wrote something, well, he didn't write, I shouldn't say that. Um, we don't have anything written by Epictetus. He had a student named Arian uh, who would write, took, took down a lot of his lectures and something called the Discourses, and, they, and then a short digest of his major ideas in something called the Handbook, the Enchiridion. That handbook was used in uh, the Orth Eastern Orthodox churches in the, the, monast the, by, in the monasteries, as a kind of guide to life, and they would cross out Socrates as one of the heroes. Socrates is the big hero of the Stoics. They would cross out Socrates and put St. Paul, and you know, they would kind of... Be, so uh, some of these ideas got absorbed into Christianity uh, the, because there's a heavy mind-body dichotomy, all, not in early Stoics, but in the late Stoics that we're talking about here. There's a heavy mind-body dichotomy. The soul, it, man is a soul carrying a corpse. Marcus Aurelius is always saying, despise the flesh. And, you know, that heavily comes in. And the whole idea is that keep your soul, the whole duty perspective, like if you read Ayn Rand's essay, Causality versus Duty, and that whole second section about the duty mentality, uh, the disciple of duty or whatever, it's, yeah, you're heavily internalized, you're focused on inside, what's my character like, did I step over the line, am I, am I unvirtuous? And they're not focused outward on achievement. What are the goals? What do I want out of life? And whereas the person who's focused on causality, it's like, oh, you're focused on values. Yeah, and so I think some of that got absorbed into Christianity. If Stoics were deterministic, why did they think that they had efficacy in shaping their moral character? Yeah, well, this is a fundamental problem. I think this is a fundamental problem with Stoicism, which is intractable. Uh, so I wrote about this in my article, The False Promise of Stoicism. It's that, on the one hand, Everything is fated to be everything as it is, and, there, and nothing could be otherwise. And now they're giving us moral guidance to tell us how we should shape our lives. And that sounds incoherent. And I think it is incoherent, and it was recognized in the ancient Greek world. I mean, the Epicureans, you know, the, their kind of rival school, were po always pointing that out to them. Uh, you know, so they were, what, what Chrysippus, Chrysippus was the major architect of uh, Stoicism as a large-scale systematic theoretical philosophy. Um, and, you know, his view was to try to defend the idea that not free will per se, but moral responsibility. So he wanted, he said, yes, we think that everything is fated and so on, but you're still morally responsible for your actions. And the way they did it was, um, suppose you take some action, you rob a bank, <laughs> whatever. If you hadn't chosen to rob the bank, if you hadn't been the kind of person you are that chooses to rob a bank, the bank wouldn't have gotten robbed, right? So on the one hand, there's an external stimulus, that attractive money over there. And on the other hand, there's your character. And both of those things contribute to the event. And it's not, he's not the one that did it, she didn't do it, right? So in the way he's trying to see, you're responsible for it because the causality flows through you um, and flows through your judgment and flows through your choice. Now there's a question is, yeah, but what if I couldn't have chosen any different? That's what the Epicureans, uh, Epicureans, said, well, if you can't choose any different, what is he? And then it becomes a little more complicated with Epictetus because Epictetus much more sounds like he's saying you have free will in the way he talks. Um, uh, but I think that's not true, though. I don't think that's the way he thinks about it, actually. But that's a longer discussion. But Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thank you for an absolutely fascinating picture that's like Oh, I want to know more. And what I want to know is you just mentioned in the Q&A about a number of different philosophies that were all in retreat. But you didn't mention one that I was interested in that might have been going in the 
different direction. Could mm-hmm. you talk about the sophists and where they compare to? Because they seem like they were taking over. Uh, well, the I don't know much about people who would be considered sophists in the Hellenistic period, so the post-Aristotelian period. Um, but the the sophists that get talked a lot about in ancient Greek philosophy are are often operating in the time of Socrates, so several hundred years earlier. Uh, and these were, in effect, itinerant teachers, many of which con- congregated in Athens, and they were, in effect, giving various um, higher education in various domains, largely rhetoric, and but also mathematics and different kinds of things. Um, and I think they were certainly much more worldly. I mean, this is about worldly success. I mean, one of the reasons why they got paid so much, I mean, Socrates is always talking about how much they got paid and the wealthy people would pay them a lot. Yeah, but is that they're trying to achieve some sort of worldly success. They're trying to achieve a, maybe a political career that's successful or to uh, be successful in arguing in law courts. And it's about, it's a very outward focused. Um, the place to look for the roots of a lot of this retreat is Socrates. Okay. Um, because, I mean, if you read his dialogue, The Phaedo, I mean, philosophy is a preparation for dying. Uh, and you read the Apology. It's like, what matters is the care of the soul. You know? And they constantly... And he's, he's the patron saint for all of these philosophers. Uh, okay, it's, that, yeah. that, 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 was, that was my... Yeah. And Socrates was often could have lumped in with yeah. the sophists, but he was not worldly in that regard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Aaron, uh, what is your perspective on how to like deeply value things and go after them, experience gains or losses, but yet have inner serenity and peace? And also, I mean, should you value inner serenity and peace, or should you value the inner tumult or be okay with it? <sighs> okay, that's a, that's a big abstract question. Uh, how, do you, how do you deeply value things? That's a funny question. I have to just introspect. I don't think of it like a philosophical, like here, here's the, the thing. Um, I don't know what I say. I, I deeply value that. I don't know what I say. You have to recognize um, something as being personally important to you. I think the, the, person that's, it, the idea that it's personal, I think, is important because you can have all sorts of things that you're told to value. And you can say, yeah, I'm told to value that. And so I'll kind of make some movements a little bit in that direction, but you're not invested in it because it's not important to you. Um, I just for, uh, shouldn't use personal examples all the time. So I, I have several Japanese cooking knives. Uh, I cook a lot uh, and they're made by like individual blacksmiths in Japan. So I order them and stuff and they're really beautiful. And part of it is I cook all the time. I really like cooking, and I, I like my, my tools are beautiful. They're precision instruments. So they're very I'm a, a sensitive to anything like aesthetic. Uh, and I try to, one of the things I try to do is to try to make nothing neutral in my home. Um, I think that's one of the things that you can do. So, sort of, I, so they're trying to get away from attachments. My view is I want as many attachments as I possibly can to the world. It's like, you know, fishing hooks, the reality and life has in me, all of it, like, give it to me, right? Like, I want to be fully invested in the world. I want to love a lot of things. Um, and I want to try to build the number of things that I have that I am invested. So nothing's neutral. Even just like a, like a hand towel, I don't know, in, in the kitchen. It's like, why do I have this generic thing that I just bought from whatever? Because I thought, yeah, it was a hand towel, whatever. And just like little things, you try to like, well, maybe I can find something that actually that I actually like, that I enjoy, maybe like the texture of it, or it absorbs really well, or whatever, or it looks nice. And you try to find things where you can build more and more into your life, things that actually matter to you, and they're not value neutral. Right, no, I guess my question was, how do you still be serene and peace within yourself when you don't get them or when you lose them? Yeah, I think serenity ultimately, uh, so I think ser- in, inner, that kind of inner peace and serenity, I think it is a value. This sort of blank tranquility is not a value. Um, I think that that's follows as a result of not caring about things. But inner serenity, think of Howard Rourke. He's at peace, and he's intense. And I think the inner serenity comes from he has a fundamental confidence in his ability to deal with reality. He knows who he is. He knows what he wants. He, he knows he's achieved a kind of skill set and ability that he can function. He can, so 
I mean, this goes back to the purpose of building a virtuous character. It's not about putting another brick in the wall of your inner citadel, you know, that's not, you know, so you can wall yourself against getting hurt. That's not what it's about. It's about, like, you're, you're kidding out a Jeep for, like, off-roading or something. You got a couple of extra gas tanks on the back, and you got a winch, and you got, you're, you're trying to outfit yourself for successful value achievement in the world. And I think developing virtues, you know, you think about, like, independence and courage and, you know, and honesty, rationality, you think about the kind of virtues that Iron puts, you're trying to fit yourself out, get yourself ready and capable for successful functioning in life, successful value achievement in life. I mean, what's life anyway? It's, it's, life is simply a continuous pursuit of values. You pursue values, you achieve them, you use them, you enjoy them so that you can continue to pursue them, achieve them. It's a, it just, all it is is value, pursuit, and achievement. Um, and so you're trying to fit yourself out uh, in a way that... Uh, enables you to do that. And Rourke has done that. Um, so yeah, okay, he, he doesn't get a certain kind of commission. He has to close his office and work in a quarry. But he's serene at what he does. Uh, there's a certain respect even in which he takes some enjoyment in, in what he does. And I think that's where the real serenity comes from. Uh, and I, I'd be the last person to sort of downplay like peace of mind. If you've ever been through periods where you're doing triage, you know, in life, and it's like you get to the point, I've, I've had periods like this where it's, I can't handle all of these things at once. And at some point you have to say, I, it's not that I don't care, but I, can't, I have to get myself where I, I to not care about this and this and this can't be important to me because if I make everything important, I'm going to go nuts. And, and, and you know, I, during that period where I experienced that, um, uh, was not a good period, but I, I started doing that a lot. Uh, and the bad thing is, um, is that, the result was I started to feel emotionally flat. Just kind of flatlined about, I didn't get that excited about anything. I didn't care about a lot of things. And it was just sort of, I felt, oh, there's something really deeply wrong with that. If that's, if that's where it's taking me emotionally, something deeply wrong with how I'm handling this. It's one thing, it's like, oh, I'll, I'll try not to care about that for now, just, but just for now. You know, if you're in a, some sort of crisis and then you kind of come back and kind of reattach and stuff, but I feel like I wasn't reattaching. And it, yeah, that took me a while to get out of that, which was weird. Uh, I, I didn't anticipate it. Uh, but that's just a personal anecdote. Sorry. Go ahead. You mentioned Howard Rourke. Would you say that the um, interactions between him and Dominique in the beginning of The Fountainhead, with Dominique being a character who. Um, sort of destroys the things she loves or tries to. Uh, do you think that's a good illustration of the differences between stoicism and objectivism? Well, Dominique certainly has elements of a, a stoic approach, uh, you know, in the sense that, um, you know, to, to, to want nothing, you know, that, that, that whole thing is, is I, I, I don't want attachments to things um, because the world will destroy them. Uh, and then this is too, too painful. Uh, there's certainly elements of that. And part of what you see throughout the life is she didn't need to take that approach. Uh, oh, sorry, what you see through the course of the novel is that she doesn't need to take that approach. And I think this is important in relation to Stoicism because one of the things that Rourke teaches her or helps her to kind of come to understand uh, is that she's giving way too much power to evil, to malevolence, to the bad. I mean, if you pick up one of these books, I, I was looking at William Irvine's book, uh, what is it called? Um, the Ancient Art of Stoic Joy or something like that. It's a 2009 book. And you just look at the chapter headings. Grief, loss, suffering, insults. <laughs> you just, uh, one, uh, one after the other, death, suffering. And it's like everything is focused on the negative. So I think there's a heavy element of what objectivism would call uh, the malevolent universe. You know, it's, you know, life is just full of suffering. It's part of the nature of life. You can't control anything. It's out of control at least you can control how you react to it so you, you, you don't get hurt. And I think there's a heavy kind of malevolent universe premise there, as, as there was in Dominique. Thank you. Hi. Um, that was actually part of my question. Um, if one accepts the malevolent universe premise, uh, would Stoicism be the rational philosophy to adopt? <laughs> there's something about the nature of that question, which is why you know, there's a couple, couple chuckles, but there's a... Um, the malevolent universe premise is um, is not the right way to look at the world. 
And so I don't think it's, if you have a bad premise, can you build, a, is, is this the rational philosophy to take? Maybe I, maybe I led into that by talking about the prison situation, like where if you really were in a prison, there's nothing you can do, absolutely. And all you can do is try to come to terms in some way and make it hurt less. Yeah, I think that would make sense. I mean, why not reduce whatever suffering you have? Um, but the idea is that, uh, I mean, for her is, well, It isn't a rational philosophy on the one hand, and, and the, uh, the uh, malevolent universe premise is, how would you put it, misguided. So I'm not sure how to answer that question, so I, you know, if you, you can see that. Okay. Maybe we can chat more later. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, just a couple of things, a quick quip. I think Marcus Aurelius has become really popular recently because he has a really good YouTube algorithm. Um, I'll be watching a symphony, and there's Marcus Aurelius. I'll watch a workout video. There he is. So um, he's got a really good algorithm going. Um, but in addition, um, I was curious about with the concept of non-attachment. Um, I was living in a Yoga Vedanta monastery for about five and a half years. Um, this was a very central tenet to it. Um, and I saw and also experience that kind of deadening that can happen where you're detaching, you're dissociating. But I also saw those who were very vibrant, very alive, because they took non-attachment to mean you know it's transient, so you're so deeply with it while it's there. And similarly to the objective confidence talk, you know that you're going to be okay when it goes, or you know you'll be okay regardless of the outcome. And I think some of the producers in Atlas Shrugged also had this, where the railroad gets destroyed, but you know that Dagny's going to be okay, and she knows it. Um, so I was curious what your thoughts would be about that. Yeah, but when it comes to, yeah, that's a good point. When it comes to the producers in Rand's novels and stuff, though, the idea is that, um, yes, maybe something doesn't turn out the way they want, maybe Rourke doesn't get a commission, maybe Ben Neely quits and they have to find another contractor, or, you know, whatever it is on the railroad. But the idea isn't so much that... Um, uh, their idea is not about non-attachment or life is fleeting and things happen and I just have to live in the moment. They live long range. And I think one of the ideas about living in the moment is you have to plan out and think out and project out what do I want it to shape up as a whole? And you spend part of your life, you know, kind of building a life across time and you have to imagine it as lasting. Uh, and so if it's like live each day as if it's your last, you can't really plan long range. But there is something to the idea that uh, I'll be okay uh, if I lose this or lose that. And I think there's something about that. I think if you, if you have a kind of, um, if you've built a certain kind of character and you've built a track record with yourself of I can handle I can handle the world I can handle what life throws at me and I think you, you should want to be in that position so that you're not devastated by uh, things that happen to you but I think there are certain things that might devastate someone just because how much you care about it uh, but then the the other side is that you spent your life caring about something that really mattered and I think that's what gives life it's um, it's what makes you want to hang on to life Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I would like to ask you about determinism, mm -hmm. and that is uh, in um, connection with Stoicism. First off, would you consider determinism to be uh, an essential feature, or would you see that uh, that Stoicism could technically work most of what it does, even without the deterministic element? Uh, perhaps just. Uh, one thing that's relevant to me is that I see determinism as a way to um, kind of gain solace and in a similar way that the others... Uh, a way of what? Of gaining solace. Oh, gaining kinda solace. Protecting yeah. themselves uh, from suffering in the sense of, yeah, I uh, made this mistake, horrible things happened, but it was really not in my control, so I can't, uh, so there's no reason for me to think badly of myself, uh, of... Um, and same thing for other people. They, oh, well, they did these horrible things, but they couldn't help it. The, the, I couldn't help it, they couldn't help it approach. And it seems similar, but it seems to be kind of logically disconnected from the rest of uh, Stoicism. And I was... To, uh, so I think, okay, yeah, so I'm watching it. The timer here is really running down. But let me, and you asked me about determinism. So um, I think that... Uh, 
the, I think determinism is an essential feature of Stoic philosophy. If you look at ancient Stoic philosophy, none of them dropped that. I think there's only one scholar I know who thinks Epictetus might be introducing an element of free will that was not traditional in Stoicism, but I don't think that's what's going on. But um, it was an, it, always a feature of Stoic philosophy the ancient, in the ancient world, from the Greek Stoics to the Roman Stoics. It's that um, the, everything functions by cause and effect, uh, and that that whole causal sequence is faded. You know, so there, you know, there's a beginning cause in effect, and everything else comes out of it flows inexorably. Um, I think it's part of the reason why they feel like, you know, everything, things are out of our control, and we only have to focus on the judgment. And that's why they had this problem of us. So how do we then think about our judgments? Like, you know, because to think or not to think, as we put, is that up to you? So did you have to make that choice? Was that faded eternally? Because if it was. Nothing is up to you. So, and then they had to determine how to figure, out. they had to try to figure out how to deal with that. Most of the Roman Stoics, they didn't bother with the question. Just, they just didn't concern themselves with. Yeah. Can I, if I still have the time. No. I think we got, okay, I guess we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much.